Good afternoon and welcome to the Interior Department. My name is Tim Fullerton. I'm the Director of New Media here and I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for a chat on outdoor recreation and conservation issues. Uh, we are very lucky to have Secretary Ken Salazar here who's going to be answering your questions over the next 30 to 40 minutes. We've already gotten some really great ones so far, but if you haven't had a, get, had a chance to uh, send one in yet, please do so in the chat window below and uh, we'll, be tr we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, and before I turn it over to Secretary, I just want to thank all the members of the National Wildlife Federation who have sent in some great questions. Uh, we really appreciate you guys being on today. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, would you like to open us up? Well, first, let me say to the members of the National Wildlife Federation and all of you who are watching, I appreciate the storied and long leadership of all the members of the National Wild Wildlife Federation in creating the conservation legacy that we have here in the United States of America. I work with your leadership on many issues all around the country, and I very much appreciate your hard work. Secondly, I want to say that conservation is um, an issue which is as important today as it was uh, 100 years ago when uh, President Roosevelt really started the movement uh, by bringing together conservationists from around the country here to Washington, D.C. We have a lot of work to do. We have uh, major challenges ahead, including uh, funding challenges for conservation. But the way that we are going to succeed on our conservation agenda is making sure that there is a very strong voice for conservation uh, here in the halls of Congress, uh, in Washington, D.C., and throughout the United States of America. So I'm pleased to join you, Tim, and uh, the members of the National Wildlife Federation and others who are watching this chat this afternoon. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The first question is coming from Stephen, uh, who lives in Missouri. And his question is, what is being done to share the positive message of outdoor recreation and conservation uh, within the halls of Congress? Now, Stephen, I appreciate the question. Uh, first, it's jobs. Uh, next, it's uh, health. And third, uh, it's our culture and heritage. And so we have been uh, making sure that Congress understands the importance of, uh, that, uh, the importance of conservation and preservation. So this last year, uh, the conservation community came together and uh, funded a study that shows that there is about 8 million jobs that are created just through outdoor recreation and conservation and historic preservation. Uh, we were having a hard time, actually, with Congress uh, earlier in the year because the House of Representatives had decided to slash the budgets of uh, all conservation America in a way that would have set us back probably 50 years. For example, they had decided to cut the Fish and Wildlife Service and our National Wildlife Refuge System by 22 uh, percent. That would have required the closure of approximately 100 uh, wildlife refuges. So we essentially had a call to arms where we brought together all the leaders of uh, the conservation community as well as uh, the outdoor recreation business community. And we're knocking on the halls of uh, the people of Congress and the message to them was simple. Uh, Eight million American jobs depend on uh, conservation and outdoor recreation every year. Uh, number two, this is part of the conservation legacy of America and that's why we are the envy of the world in conservation. So it's important that you not defund these programs. And at the end of the day, we were fairly successful. Uh, we still have some challenges ahead of us. But I think the message to Congress has been delivered uh, loud and clear, and it's been uh, a bipartisan message. There were many Democrats obviously involved. I was involved. Uh, the president was involved. Others were involved. But also we had uh, Republicans who uh, very much believe in the cause of conservation for hunting, for uh, fishing, uh, for outdoor recreation. They were very much uh, a part of uh, this team. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the next question is going to come uh, from Greg, uh, who's with the American Hiking, uh, Hiking uh, Society. And his question is, Mr. Secretary, how can we better integrate the good efforts uh, that Interior and the Department of Agriculture are doing regarding the America's Great Outdoors Initiative and the economic benefits with other agencies like Education, uh, Health and Human Services, the CDC, and others? Greg, uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, the America's Great Outdoors uh, Project was announced by the governor or by the president not more, more than a year ago. And uh, we have been working very hard in developing and implementing America's Great Outdoors. So on landscapes of national significance, which are important to all of you who are watching here, we move forward with establishing the Everglades Headwaters Conservation Area, the Flint Hills National Conservation Area, the Crown of the Continent, and many other initiatives like that. We've also moved forward with the next generation of urban parks, so putting a focus on places like New York City and St. Louis and uh, Denver, Colorado and Los Angeles. We're moving forward with new urban parks. And thirdly, focusing in on rivers and how we might be able to start an, uh, a revival around how we restore America's rivers. Those have been very much a part of, uh, of America's great outdoors. Now, our linkage 
with the Department of Agriculture has been seamless on this effort. Uh, Secretary Vilsack and I have been uh, leading this effort for the last year. I met with him yesterday to make sure that our relationship with the U.S. Forest Service is one that is strong. Uh, we still have additional work to do, but we have lots of projects that we're working on all over the country. America's Great Outdoors is identified um, as one of the parts of the initiative, 101 priority conservation projects around the country, two in each state and one in the District of Columbia. There are probably 14, 15 of those where uh, USDA, the Forest Service, is in the lead. And so we're working very cooperatively with them, uh, recognizing that between ourselves and the Forest Service, uh, there are about half a billion, so about almost 500 million visitors uh, that come to visit our public lands. And many of those are hikers uh, and other recreationists. And for those of you who would like to learn more about the America's Great Outdoors initiative, uh, you can go to our website, which is at www.americasgreatoutdoors.gov, or you can uh, uh, like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash America's Great Outdoors. Uh, so the next question, uh, we're going to move to a question on natural gas, and this is from Sandra in South Carolina. And she asks, in his State of the Union address, President Obama stated he would open public lands to drill for natural gas. How is this compatible with conservation? Sandra, it's a very good question. It's compatible with conservation in uh, that we will not allow oil and gas development in places where there is uh, sensitivity to the ecological or conservation values uh, that we have. And so as we've implemented the president's uh, energy agenda over the last three years, I've often said that uh, you can explore for oil and gas, but you just can't uh, do it everywhere, uh, that there are places that, that are going to be off limits. And so our concept has been smart from the start. We need a plan the places where oil and gas development will take place so that we're protecting the conservation values of uh, the United States. When I first came into office, uh, we canceled leases that were in the vicinity of uh, Arches uh, National Park in Utah, in large part because of the impact it would have had on, on those conservation interests. So as we move forward, we've, had, we've, we've tried to reach the right balance, knowing that natural gas is an important part of our energy portfolio for the future but also recognizing that conservation and sustainability really are the long-term values which uh, we care about so much and we need to defend. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, the next question is on uh, volunteerism, and it's from Willie in Texas. Uh, and he would like to know, how much does volunteerism impact our national parks? And if we had to pay for those uh, services, what impact would that have on the budget? You know, Willie, it's a huge impact that we have from... Uh, the friends of our national parks and our wildlife refuges. And I've traveled uh, in 49 uh, states around the country, uh, many of those states many times over the last three years, and I always tell the friends of our wildlife refuges and our national parks that uh, we are strongest in those places, but we have the strongest friends and uh, volunteer organizations. Uh, the number of volunteers that help us uh, in our public lands around the country now number over 300,000. 300,000 people who are out there volunteering at visitor centers, doing interpretation, helping us deal sometimes with maintenance, a whole host of things. That's what's allowed us to still maintain at this point in time, even under these difficult fiscal uh, conditions, the best public lands conservation program on earth. Uh, that's something that we as Americans can all be very proud of. It's something that I'm very proud of. And so Willie in Texas at Big Bend National Park, for example, we have one of the most uh, robust friends groups of Big Bend National Park. That's a million and a half acres. And the friends group are, groups are helping us with uh, funding, with improvements on some of the uh, efficiency efforts that we have on lighting at Big Bend and a whole host of other things. And I could say the same thing about most of our national parks and our wildlife refuges. So the friends groups, volunteers are absolutely essential, Willie, to everything that we do. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, the next question is uh, going to be from Carl in California. Uh, and he wants to know, how can we get uh, more motorized and mountain bike trails included in the America's Great Outdoors report? Well, Carl, uh, we uh, do have uh, many places which, uh, where we do have uh, motorized uh, off-road vehicle usage and um, roads where we have a lot of, uh, of, of off-road vehicles. Uh, I was at the Imperial Sand Dunes in uh, Southern California, near San Diego, not too long ago. And there were hundreds of uh, four-wheelers that were out there uh, with families who have now camped and uh, who have recreated on those sand dunes are now doing it in the third, fourth, and fifth generations. And I spent a lot of time with them. So as you look across our public lands, which um, number some 700 million acres, uh, it's one of three acres in the United States of America, 
I think you will find uh, ample opportunity for uh, uh, motorized uh, vehicle use of our public lands. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the next question is going to come from the chat. Um, and this question is, what can be done to help the public and sportsmen understand the great recreation opportunities on national wildlife refuges? And what can, uh, what can we do to address the backlog on our wildlife refuges? You know, uh, it's a question which uh, Director Ash and I deal with a lot. And that is, um, how do we tell a better story of our national wildlife refuge system? If you're a member of the National Wildlife Federation, you know a lot about the history and the system and the icons from the bison to the bald eagle to the whooping crane and everything else that we work on. But if you are just a regular American citizen that's not a member of the National Wildlife Federation, sometimes people don't know the story of our National Wildlife Refuge System and uh, the fact that it's the envy of the world. Um, we don't have the same resources, frankly, in uh, the refuge system that we have in the National Park System. Park system has uh, been able to better tell its story because it's been able to access uh, more uh, resources to be able to tell the story of Yellowstone and the Statue of Liberty and the like. But we're doing a better job with the wildlife refuge system and uh, Dan Ash and I and especially our partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Foundation and Jeff Trandall and his leadership there. Uh, it's been a tremendous, uh, su tremendously successful effort, but we need to continue to build on those successes so that the uh, people in the United States know that uh, our refuge system is there for their enjoyment. You know, in Colorado, one quick example, in Denver, we're trying to establish linkages between three wildlife refuges, and they're along the, what they call the Rocky Mountain Arsenal and the South Platte River and its tributaries and Rocky Flats. But we have just been doing over the last several uh, weeks is actually putting signage on the main uh, highways, I-70 and I-25, that will actually indicate that uh, the wildlife refuge is there and it's uh, for the visitation pleasure of people. So uh, I hope through our promotional efforts uh, we'll be able to enhance uh, the visibility of our national wildlife refuges. And we'll give it one more plug. If, uh, if you want to find some information online about the refuge system, you can go to fws.gov. And uh, Director Ash has a great blog uh, that's right on the homepage there too. And he tells a lot of great stories about the refuge system. So definitely recommend you check that out. Um, so now we're going to move on to another question. Uh, this one's from Neil in Wyoming. And his question is, will there be funding for the enhancement of the existing sage-grouse habitat? Yep. Neil, uh, the sage-grouse habitat initiative, uh, not only in Wyoming, but in 10 other states across the West, is of high priority for us. Uh, we have, uh, in the United States, about 42% of the sage-grouse habitat. And so Bob Abbey, the director of the BLM, is leading our sage-grouse efforts, working closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And our hope is that in partnership with the states, we'll be able to map out those lands that have all the sweet spots of uh, sage-grouse habitat and then be able to put in protective measures, whether they're through new refuges or whether it's through conservation easement by landowners or through the planning efforts of the BLM to make sure that we succeed on, uh, on saving the, saving the sage-grouse. And yes, there is money available from different sources. Uh, the USDA, for example, this is another uh, huge uh, opportunity we have working with the Department of Agriculture and their NCRS program. They're providing money for conservation easements on some of these lands to protect uh, sage-grouse habitat. So we're going to succeed on this, uh, but it's going to be tough because the sage-grouse habitat covers so, so many states, 11 states, the politics of those states are different. I think Wyoming, we have been able to move forward and uh, we have a very good program underway in Wyoming. We're trying to take Wyoming as a template and as an example for what we do in other states. And uh, we are looking to have a, a plan that is complete by uh, July 1 that we can then send out to the public on how we're gonna spread the Sage Grouse Conservation Initiative across the Western states. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone uh, again, just take a little break here to uh, uh, thank everyone for joining us today. Um, if you're just joining us, uh, the full chat will be available on DOI.gov uh, in the next couple of days. Um, and also, if you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, we're getting a lot of really great questions on here. But keep them coming. We've still got a few minutes to go on this chat, so we're going to keep moving along. A uh, question uh, from the chat. Steve uh, from New Mexico is asking, what role can municipal and agricultural conservation play in maintaining river flows for fished wildlife and recreation? You know, Steve, uh, I think they can play a huge role. And I think, Steve, in uh, your state in New Mexico, in the middle Rio Grande River, you know, I've had several meetings down there in New Mexico on how we might be able to restore 
the 100 miles of the middle Rio Grande for its uh, wildlife uh, refuge uh, uh, values. Now, there are lots of jurisdictions and lots of issues and, and, and huge complexities with it, but I think there is a common view among uh, all the players, the city of Albuquerque, the state of New Mexico, the United States, uh, the tribes and others, that we can move forward with the restoration effort on the 100 mile stretch of the middle Rio Grande. So Director Ash is working with the stakeholders and we expect to have a program in place by uh, the uh, 1st of July uh, on the middle Rio Grande. And it includes uh, you know, the acquisition of Price's Dairy, which is a 640 acre farm in uh, Albuquerque that has some of the most important water rights, and those water rights uh, will be dedicated to the in-stream flows on the Rio Grande within that section. So we're making progress, and um, frankly, in uh, your state of New Mexico, not only uh, has the city of Albuquerque, but also the county of Bernalillo been extremely helpful in terms of moving forward and actually providing some money to be able to help us with these restoration efforts. So it's an exciting template, and. Uh, what also is very exciting about it, uh, Steve, is that it's happening uh, all over the place. It's the, New Mexico is just one example, but we see these things happening all over the country. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, we've got another question from the chat here. Uh, and this question is, what is the best way for Native American tribes uh, to protect cultural resources on public lands outside of reservation boundaries? You know, I think um, this is an area where um, we uh, need to make sure that we in the United States are doing everything we can to protect uh, those cultural resources that are so important to uh, Native American tribes. You know, um, we have a new chapter in the United States uh, in our relationship with uh, the nation's first Americans. 565 tribal nations who have now come here to Interior for three years in a row to meet with President Obama and me and other cabinet secretaries. And we put in place uh, the kind of um, of, of relationship where we have constant communication and consultation with the tribes. And I know that the issue of the preservation of uh, cultural resources on public lands for Native Americans is one that is of high priority. So Assistant Secretary Larry Echohawk and I have been uh, working hard to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect those resources. Sometimes it's led, um, for example, in um, Utah, you know, we had to do a major criminal law enforcement action because of the destruction of some uh, priceless uh, burial grounds and other cultural resources for Native Americans. And uh, you know, those people have been prosecuted, those who were uh, destroying those, those precious resources. So it's an enforcement matter. It's also an educational effort. But at the end of the day, it's about working closely with uh, the First Nations of America so that uh, they know what we're doing and we can be as helpful as we possibly can. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, a question about childhood obesity that came in from Sally. Sally, and her, name, or her question is, childhood obesity costs the U.S. roughly $3 billion annually, and a large part of that is a result of children spending hours indoors rather than outdoors. Uh, what can be done on a national level to promote the idea of getting children outdoors? You know, Sally, we can uh, promote getting children outdoors. It's uh, been uh, a major effort of uh, the president and his administration. Uh, the first lady, Michelle Obama, is uh, about ready to hit the road uh, for three days to different parts around the country where she's celebrating and touting her Let's Move uh, initiative. And uh, it's because it's uh, focused and uh, we know it can be very effective in terms of uh, tackle tackling uh, childhood obesity. In addition to that, uh, we are working closely with the Department of Education to make sure that uh, we are developing uh, uh, places and schools around the country where people recognize the importance of the connection between health and outdoor recreation. And at the same time, we're doing the same thing with uh, health and human services. So it's, uh, you know, the, the ha people's health and what they eat and how much they play in the outdoors uh, go hand in hand. Uh, and if you'd like more information on the uh, Let's Move initiative, you can go to letsmove.gov uh, for a variety of uh, uh, ways that you can help promote uh, getting kids outdoors. Um, all right, so we're going to move to another question here, and this is a question related to uh, climate change. And Dan in Pennsylvania asks, do you believe that there is a link between conservation and uh, mitigating climate change? No. Dan, it's an excellent question. And uh, the fact is uh, absolutely there is a link. Um, there's a link uh, on a number of different fronts. Uh, first, um, we know that our conservation resources are uh, 
forests and our grasses, our um, uh, habitat that is out there, essentially serves as a carbon sink. And so to the extent that we have these places that we have protected in conservation, they help us address uh, the issue of uh, climate change because they soak up uh, the CO2 that otherwise is escaping, escaping into the atmosphere and creating the, the warming of, of, of our Earth. So there is uh, that very specific uh, nexus. There also is uh, the connection that we know that climate change is happening and it's uh, affecting our conservation values and assets of America. Glacier National Park, I always use as an example because I think it drives the, home, the, the point home very closely. You know, Glacier National Park was named Glacier National Park because of the glaciers. And yet uh, the predictions now of our scientists is that the glaciers are going to be gone by the year 2020. And that's because you see the warming of the climate. When you see the weather, for example, this year in the state of Montana and what's happening with the pine beetle infestation in the state of Montana, that's because you've had such warm trends that have come from the north down into the southern part. So you know, there's a complete connection between understanding the warming of our earth and the, the need for conservation. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, and now we're going to move to another question from the chat. Um, and the question says, uh, thank you for significant steps that Interior has made on solar planning on federal lands. Um, what can be done to get the PEIS done this year and ensure that uh, it protects wildlife and sportsman access? Uh, we are on track on uh, solar energy and on the solar uh, PEIS. Uh, that will set out the roadmap for solar energy development on public lands in the future for the United States of America. Uh, let me say first that we are proud of the fact that uh, we have done a lot in Interior to show the world that we can make uh, renewable energy a reality. Uh, we will be able to have uh, permitted uh, enough solar energy facilities, geothermal and wind energy facilities to power 3 million homes by the end of this year. That's going to be uh, 10,000 megawatts by the end of, of 2012. Now as we have moved forward with solar energy development especially, we have recognized the importance of making sure that we're also doing it in the right ways. And so the sportsman community has been very involved with us. So as we move forward with mapping out the zones where solar energy will be developed, we are deconflicting those zones so we're not coming into conflict with uh, conservation or ecological values. So it's part of our SMART from the start effort and uh, we're well on the way to have the plan for the future uh, completed this year. We will get it done. Great. Uh we have another question now that's related to uh, funding uh, uh, for outdoor recreation and conservation. Um, this question is from Va Vaughn in D.C. and uh, He writes, given that sportsmen and outdoor recreation uh, enthusiasts contribute almost $1 trillion to the U.S. economy annually, what can we as sportsmen do to convince con Congress to continue funding uh, conservation-related federal programs? You know, Vaughn, I think letting uh, your member of Congress where you live um, know about your interest and the importance of funding for conservation at the end of the day, um, as much uh, authority as I may think I have, I'm power secretary of interior with members of Congress, I frankly have very little in comparison to the people who live in their congressional districts. And so letting the members of uh, your congressional district know how important uh, conservation is, how important hunting and angling and biking and uh, rafting and all the great things that we do uh, as part of our conservation uh, activities. Uh, the members of Congress need to know, and uh, it helps a lot when it's uh, people from the district who are letting them know, keep investing in conservation because uh, it's good for a lot of reasons. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. All right. The next question is from Amber in Colorado, and uh, she writes, knowing that the Colorado River is an integral part of our Latino heritage and culture, how can the Colorado River Supply and Demand Study help to continue our strong Latino history in the Southwest? Well, Amber, uh, first of all, I hear that it's uh, snowing again in uh, Denver, uh, that there's four inches on the ground today and a couple of feet, I think, over the weekend. So uh, I don't know what's happening with the climate, but it's crazy. <laughs> but I wasn't there to help shovel out a driveway or a, or a sidewalk uh, over the weekend. The Colorado River and uh, what it means, it means a lot to a lot of people. It means a lot to some 40 million people who uh, depend on the water of the Colorado River Basin, a lot to the more than 10 Indian tribes that uh, have a huge stake in the future of the Colorado River. It means a lot to those uh, whose uh, communities, many Latino communities, founded along the Colorado River Basin. And so I think that uh, what I would say, Sally, is important here is that more people become aware, uh, just like you have, Amber, it's Amber, who, who become aware of uh, 
the great assets that we have along the Colorado River Basin and uh, how we take care of that river is really going to define uh, the whole future of, uh, of the Southwest. You think about it from a Colorado perspective, uh, from the great snow-capped uh, Rocky Mountains at 14,000 foot peak of Rocky Mountain National Park, all the way through the Gunnison Gorge and down through Grand Junction, all the way into Lake Powell and Lake Mead and all the way into Mexico. It is a tremendous asset uh, over which uh, I have a tremendous amount of responsibility. It's a river that we watch very closely and uh, we have great partnerships with the states, with uh, local organizations on defining the future of the river. And certainly the effort, um, Amber, that you have underway in uh, Denver to make sure that uh, the community is connected up from a Latino heritage point of view is uh, very important to us. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, all right, we're going to take another question uh, from the chat here, and it is, uh, it's a good question. It's how does the economic benefit of conservation measure up against the economic benefit of uh, Marcellus uh, gas development, and how do we calculate the economics of conservation? Well, first on the economics of conservation, that really has been the message that has saved the conservation funding and the conservation agenda for this country in this tough fiscal climate that we've navigated through the last year. And so reminding people about the 8 million jobs that are dependent on conservation and outdoor recreation and preservation has been important. Reminding them that the best economists of the country have said that through tourism and outdoor recreation we can create an additional 2.1 to 3.3 million jobs in the next 10 years. Those economic statistics and facts are important for the rest of the, of the world to, to know. Now in terms of uh, the Marcellus Shale and how you balance that out against conservation, you know, we need to make sure that it, as development of our natural resources takes place, that it's done in a safe and responsible way. So for example, on uh, the fr fracking materials for fracking fluids, you know, we believe, and the President said in the State of the Union, that we need to have disclosure. We need to make sure that uh, water quality is being protected. And so making sure that there's the appropriate uh, regime in place to safeguard our, our environment is essential to continuing the conservation legacy of the country. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I uh, just want to remind everybody, if you're just joining us, um, this whole chat will be available on DOI.gov later uh, this week. Um, we probably have about five minutes left, so if you've got a real burning question, now will be the time to uh, send it in. Um, so we'll just keep getting back to the chat. Um, and this is another one from online. Um, and the question is related to the uh, BP oil spill. And the question is, the conservation community has rallied around legislation to direct Clean Water Act penalties from the oil spill back to the Gulf uh, for recreation of the, uh, uh, restoration of the ecosystems. Uh, can you update us on uh, DOI's efforts in these areas? Yeah, we're working uh, very hard on it. In fact, uh, today probably I've spent uh, two and a half hours just working on this issue. And there's two tracks underway. One is... Uh, getting ready for what could be the trial of the century with, uh, uh, against you know, the United States, against uh, the oil companies and those who uh, were responsible for the, the pollution in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and there may be a trial. You know, there's another set of discussions going on with a potential settlement. And no matter what happens uh, and how we end up uh, moving forward, it's been the view of the president and uh, it's been my view and the view of my colleagues on the cabinet that most of the money that will come from uh, the civil penalties, which will be significant, uh, other penalties as well as uh, the natural resource damages funds, should be the power that drives the largest ecosystem restoration project in the history of the world. And that is all intended to restore the Gulf of Mexico to a place where it should be. You know, for 50 for 100 years, the Gulf Coast uh, has been degraded uh, decade after decade after decade. And we have an opportunity here to do something that uh, we were never able to do, frankly, as a country, because uh, we did not have the resources to restore the Gulf Coast. Uh, I expect that we will, and I expect that we'll be successful in the restoration of the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. All right, we're going to take another question uh, from online here. And uh, the question is, are there any direct actions being taken to help educate a younger generation of future sportsmen and women about the importance of conservation? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, a key part of the President's America's Great Outdoors initiative has been to make sure that what we're doing is uh, creating opportunities for young people to participate in conservation. Here at Interior, we manifest our efforts uh, by hiring 
12,000 young people who will be working with us uh, in our parks and refuges uh, and other facilities just this year alone in 2012. So it's 12,000 young people. When I meet with them, as I often do all around the country, I say that they are the next generation of conservation leaders for America. I'm very proud of them, just like I am of you, Tim. <laughs> you know, I see you as being a great leader in conservation for uh, you know, decades and decades to come. And there are uh, literally, I mean, this is just one agency, you know, the Department of Interior with 12,000 young people, but we're doing it across the government. In addition to that, uh, our nonprofit partners are out there doing the same thing. Local governments are doing the same thing. Uh, so we need to make sure we're doing those, making those, those connections. You know, I, I, one of the most moving things for me is when I uh, go out and I meet with young people who for the first time are experiencing the outdoors uh, in the San, Gabriel, the, the San Gabriel Mountains in California, for example, meeting with young people who for the first time are coming in from East LA and experiencing the great outdoors, how impactful it is to them and to their lives. So we, a, a cornerstone of our America's great outdoors agenda is to connect young people to conservation and to the outdoors. Great, thank you, Mr. Secretary. And uh, if you want to get more information on the efforts we're doing on youth, uh, you can go to youth youthgo.gov. Uh, there's a lot of information there about summer employment and other ways you can get involved to help get uh, a youth uh, outdoors in America. So it's a really great website. Um, that is all the time we have for today. We want to thank the National Wildlife Federation and their members for joining us and everybody else who has joined us for this chat today. I'm going to give the secretary just a few moments to uh, wrap it up. But again, the whole chat will be available on doi.gov slash live. And if you'd like to connect with us online after this, you can do so on Twitter, just at Interior, or on Facebook, at U.S. Interior. So, Mr. Secretary, I'll turn it over to you to close this out. Thank you very much, Tim, and thank you all for uh, listening in to uh, this chat that we've had here this afternoon uh, from uh, the uh, cafeteria, Bison Bistro at Interior. Uh, I would uh, say thank you to the National Wildlife Federation and to all of those of you who have participated. I think our challenges in conservation are many, but we continue to lead the world as uh, the example for conservation. Uh, as we move forward, we need to make sure we're connecting young people to the great outdoors. And we're working with our partners at local and state communities and nonprofits to develop a new ethic of conservation that will protect America's rivers, create the next generation of urban parks, and make sure that we're protecting the landscapes of national significance from the crown of the continent in Montana to the Everglades in Florida to the longleaf pine in the southeast and all the way to the Flint Hills of Kansas. And uh, we're well on our way and I feel good about what we're doing. But at the end of the day, we'll only succeed if there is a strong voice and a march for conservation that uh, everybody can get behind. And uh, we will not win our conservation agenda if uh, we do not have the voices of uh, conservation being heard in all the halls of power around this country. Great. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Secretary, and thanks again for everyone for joining us. Until next time, have a great day, and we'll see you soon.